Good to see all of you out today and all of you that have tuned in by live stream watching us this morning. Welcome to First Baptist Church in London, Kentucky. It's good to be back with you this week. Last week I was watching live stream and uh, watched my dear friend Alan Dotson share from his heart and uh, what a moving, moving testimony that was and uh, to hear him uh, continuing to lean on Jesus. Well, it's, uh, it's good to be with you today after being out with our family for a few days in, uh, in a vacation, and uh, we're excited to be back in the harness this morning. Uh, today we're in Acts chapter 12, the last part of chapter 12, and then we're going to go into chapter 13. Chapter 13 is going to be like the second division of the book of Acts. Actually, uh, some of the early church fathers called chapters 13 to the end of the book. They called it the book of the Acts of the Apostle Paul. But that's not the name of the book. It's called the Acts of the Apostles. Some say it could even be called the Acts of the Holy Spirit. So we're in Acts chapter 12, and I'm going to talk about the glory of God today. Why it's dangerous and why it is glorious, and why we need to uh, be very, very careful about God, His glory, and His Word. I, uh, I don't know if you saw it this week, but I, I did. I was looking at it, and as I read through um, this, something that the communists in China are doing now, <clears throat> in an attempt to deal with the church that has, by some estimations, grown to a hundred million converts in China. The uh, Chinese communists are trying to figure out how they can stop this. Now, Mao Zedong, who <clears throat> was for many, many years the dictator of China, he tried to do it with a heavy hand, just stomp it out brutally with thousands and thousands of Christians being tortured, sent off to the gulags, and, and being destroyed. But uh, this new ruler they have in China, he's trying a different tact. He is rewriting the Bible. And <clears throat> in his rewriting of the Bible, he has come up with some interesting thoughts. And he's redone the whole Ten Commandments. He has uh, <clears throat> taken John chapter 8, where the woman who is taken in adultery, and where <clears throat> she is to be stoned. And in our Bible, Jesus says, you who are without sin cast the first stone. He is showing mercy and forgiveness. But in the communist version, that doesn't happen. <coughs> I've come back with the episodic, so uh, bear with me a little bit. In the communist version, what he does, Jesus says, <coughs> I am a sinner like you. Would that the law could be executed by sinless people, but it cannot. The law is the law. And then Jesus proceeds to stone the woman. So what the communists are saying is there is no mercy. The law, which in China is whatever the communists say it is, has to be obeyed without mercy. And they are rewriting the Bible, pushing it out to all of the churches there, saying that you will use this book <clears throat> or else. Well, the church in China just continues to grow in spite of all the persecution. And God is always there <clears throat> to protect his name and his glory. And you know, there's a uh, verse in the book of the Revelation when you go back to the very last chapter in the book of the Revelation. Jesus gives this warning. He says, woe to the person who adds to 
this book. For the plagues in this book shall be added unto him. Woe to the person who takes away from this book. For his name shall be taken out of the book of life. Now, whether the present premier of China understands it or not, he has just brought a curse on himself and his political party. Whether he realized it or not, he's just declared war on the God of the Bible. The Lord has said, I have placed my word above my name. So let me tell you something. God takes that serious, and so should we. It is his glory that he has imparted into his word. That's why when we read his word, we find it living. <clears throat> we find it giving life. It's the only book that is alive because it has the very breath of God on it. <clears throat> and so, we come to Acts chapter 12. And in Acts chapter 12, verse 20, let's begin reading. Now Herod, now I should stop right there and say that this is Herod Antipas I. I think a few weeks ago I gave you a uh, lineage on the background of the Herods. The word Herod, of course, is just a title, like king or president or prime minister or Pharaoh or Caesar. So this Herod is the grandson of Herod the Great. Herod the Great was the one who had all the babies killed two and under in Bethlehem. These were all Idumeans, and they were all from a political dynasty. They were all very ruthless, and they had no moral center. Whatever was good for them, well, that's just the way it was going to be. And <clears throat> so we see that Herod here was very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. Now, why is this? Because Tyre and Sidon was a seaport shipping area, and there were a lot of goods and services that moved in and out of there. Herod wanted things done a certain way because that brought in a revenue stream. Now, why was that important? Well, Herod, <laughs> this particular Herod, he was always living beyond his means. Do you know what that means? That means you spend more money than you take in. And Herod was always spending money. He was a kind of a playboy. And he was spending money on lavish gifts and palaces and clothes and anything else he wanted. But he was running out of money. So as a result, he would try to raise taxes. <clears throat> Does that sound familiar? Spending more money than you've got? Or a government spending more money than it has? And so it was always creating problems for him because he was trying to stay in favor with Rome. And if he couldn't manage his rule, Rome would take it away from him. So that's why he had a problem with Tyre and Sidon. He didn't feel like he was getting his <clears throat> whatever percent. He wasn't getting it. And so he had a real beef with them. So what does he do? <laughs> he says, I'm just going to cut off all the food supplies from here in northern Galilee that go up to you. Because northern Galilee was the breadbasket of Israel. So I'm cutting out your food. <clears throat> well, once they heard that, then they decided, well, we better play ball or else we're going to starve. It's an amazing thing how... When you start to starve, you begin to change your political alliances. And so, that's what happened. On a certain day in March, Herod would always have this big celebration. And he would give a speech, and it would last for several days, and he'd always give his speech on the second day. It was kind of like March Madness. And he would give his speech. The first day was dedicated to <clears throat> honoring Caesar. Second day, he would give a kind of a State of the Union address. That was his thing. And on this particular day, 
some of the big wigs from Tyre and Sidon sent a delegation down, to, and they talked to Blastus, the king's chamberlain, his aide de camp, and made friends with him and said, we need to resolve this. Whatever it takes, let's resolve it. And so they all got together and said, yeah, we can do that. Uh, whatever the king wants, we'll, we'll shift our policies around. <clears throat> we'll, we'll run the seaports like he wants it to. We'll see that there is an, a, a good amount of cash coming back to Herod. So it was to their political benefit to have Herod on their side. So on this particular day by the seacoast, Caesarea, what happens? Herod gets up real early. He knows it's his big day. He's going to make a speech. It's going to be a political speech. And he dresses in his royal finery. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> The Bible tells us that he put on a robe that was woven with silver. It would have silver plates woven into it. It had silver beaten into the fine threads that were woven through it. So when Herod came to the amphitheater that day to go up to sit in his special place, and as he stood there, the sun that was coming up over the ocean just struck. I've been there to that Place. I've been and I've seen it. And when the sun's rays that early in the morning, <clears throat> as the theater was filled up, began to glisten off of his robes, he was a dazzling spectacle. And as he stood there, <clears throat> he began to speak. You might say he had a silver tongue. He began to orate. He began to talk about how great his rule was. He began to talk about how everybody was so blessed because of him. He was talking about his policies, how that his policies had made things better for everybody. You know, typical political speech. And he's just throwing it out there, throwing it out there, throwing it out there. Well, somewhere along the speech... Some of these guys from Tyre and Sidon at different parts of the amphitheater began to stand up and shout. This is not the voice of a mere mortal man. This is the voice of a God. And back and forth across the amphitheater, people would shout. And of course, these are guys from Tyre and Sidon, and they had their <laughs> reasons for flattery. Now, everybody knows the difference between flattery and praise, right? Flattery is basically a lie. I'm trying to tell you something because I want something from you. That's flattery. Flattery always has as its goal getting something from you. It's not necessarily true, but it is something that will make you feel good and Maybe it will bring favor on me from you because I flattered you. Praise, on the other hand, praise is something that's based in truth. When we praise God for who he is, we are declaring truth. That is who God is. So these guys had their own agendas, and they were standing up and telling him all this stuff. And as they were telling him all this stuff, he would nod he would not. Now you say, how do you know all this? All of that's not mentioned in the Bible. No, it's not. But it is mentioned in a Jewish historian, contemporary, by the name of Josephus in his Antiquities. You can read it in volume 19. Let me give you what Josephus said. I'm quoting Josephus, not Scripture here. But it's a parallel to what Luke wrote here in the book of Acts. Josephus said, after the completion of the third year of his reign over the whole of Judea, Agrippa came to the city of Caesarea where he celebrated spectacles in honor of Caesar. And on the second day of the spectacle, clad in garments woven completely of silver, 
so that its texture was indeed wondrous. He entered the theater at daybreak. There the silver, illumined by the touch of the first rays of the sun, was wondrously radiant by its glitter, inspired fear and awe in those who gazed intently upon it. Straightway, his flatterers raised their voice from various directions, though it hardly for his good, addressing him as a god. May you be propitious to us, they said. And if we have hereto, hereto feared you as a man, yet henceforth we agree that you are no more mortal in your being. The king did not rebuke them, nor did he reject their flattery as impious. Now again, I'm reading from a historian of 2,000 years ago. But shortly thereafter, he looked up and he saw an owl perched on a rope over his head. At once, recognizing this as a harbinger of woes, just as it had been once of good tidings, he felt a stab in his heart, and he also gripped his stomach by an ache that he felt everywhere at once. Even as he was speaking these words, he was overcome by intense pain. They hastened, therefore, to convey him to his palace, and the word flashed about to everyone that he was on the verge of death. Exhausted after five straight days by the pain in his abdomen, he departed this life in the 54th year of his life and of the seventh year of his reign. Now this is Josephus, a Jewish historian, not a Christian. Now, let's, what does the Bible, how does the Bible interpret this? Well, look at verse 23. When they were saying this was the voice of a God and not of a man, the Bible says immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give what? God what? He did not give God the glory. And he was eaten by worms and he breathed his last. Now, Josephus says it took five days for him to finally, finally expire. But he did. Because he did not give glory to God. And the Bible says here, and he was eaten by what? Worms. Now, that's gross. I realize it. <clears throat> but that's what the Bible says. And he breathed his last. Now, what kind of worm? I don't know. Most say it was some kind of tapeworm <clears throat> causing an internal hemorrhaging. I don't know what it was, uh, the name of the worm, but God doesn't need a great big messenger, something as small as a worm. But the word of God increased and multiplied. Now, this is the same Herod <clears throat> back in the beginning of chapter 12 who had... James summarily beheaded. And he saw that it helped him politically to be against the Christians. And let me say this, if it ever comes to the point where it's politically advantageous to be against Christians, many politicians will follow that route. We do not serve our God out of convenience, but conviction. We do not preach the word because it's popular. We preach the word of God because it is true. We do not stand for our doctrinal faith based on historic tradition. We stand on our faith based on the power of God that has delivered it to us and has been affirmed by miracles. The Bible says here that Herod, when he received this praise, and they were calling him a god, and he was accepting these accolades, the Bible says that God said, and he says this several times, I will share my glory with no one. <clears throat> Isaiah 
chapter 42, verse 8. I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory I will give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. Isaiah 48, 11 says, For my own sake, for my own sake, I do it. For how should my name be profaned? My glory I will not give to another. And when we receive glory that belongs to God and God alone, we profane his name. And God says, I will not allow my glory to be given to another. And so he is dead. <clears throat> now notice what happens. Verse 24, but the word of God increased and multiplied. I think this sent a shock wave throughout the whole community. I think there were a lot of people who began to think, what's happening? Why is this happening? Let me just share something from a contemporary point of view. I believe God is about to do something very shocking. <clears throat> we see people all the time saying, well, we need to <clears throat> drain the swamp. Listen, folks, don't look to anybody, any person, any party, any political movement to do that. God himself will do that. And he will do it in his time and in his way. Okay? We, the church of Jesus Christ, we are not about politics. We are about the life-changing power that is in the name of Jesus. And that name we proclaim without apology. And that name we will embrace till this old world rolls over and it is no more. When God creates a new heaven and a new earth, that name shall still be proclaimed throughout the entire universe. And demons will still shake at its name. And every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that he is Lord to the glory of the Father. That name, and in that name, we stand and we proclaim. That's the way it's going to be. And so it says, And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had completed their service, bringing with them John, whose surname is Mark. In other words, John Mark. <clears throat> so the word of God is going to continue. Listen, Jesus said that the very gates of hell cannot prevail against the onslaught of the church. It is the church that is on the offensive, and the gates cannot stop it. Why? Because the power of God is behind it. The church will be here no matter what regime, what dictator, what political power tries to shut it down, make it feel ashamed of what it's teaching and believing. We will continue to uphold the Word of God despite the price, despite the cost, because it is God's word. It is truth. And he has placed his word above his name. And he will stand by his word. Now we come to chapter 13. In chapter 13, we see the great missionary movements begin. In chapter 13, now there was a church at Antioch prophets and teachers. Now this Antioch here is Antioch of Syria. There's another Antioch, Antioch of Pisidia. Syria and Pisidia. Two different cities. In chapter 13 we start off in Antioch of Syria and then we're going to end at Antioch of Pisidia which is in South Turkey. And <clears throat> so even though there's two cities, you need to keep in mind that they um, have the same name, but they're located in two different places. Now let me share with you a little bit of something about the churches. The church in Jerusalem was the mother church. This is where it all started. But the church in Antioch in Syria became the mission church. So you had the mother church, and you had the mission church in Antioch. The mother church is where the church started on the day of Pentecost. It's where the people like Peter, 
and James, John, and the rest of them. It's where they worked out of. But later, Antioch would become the missionary sending church. And we're going to see that here in chapter 13. And it says, at this church there were prophets and teachers. Now these were the two main offices of the early church, prophets and teachers. There were apostles, but prophets and teachers. The word apostolos, apostle, means one who is sent. One who is sent. And it says here that they were sent out. We're going to see that in just a moment. But then there in the church, there were prophets and teachers. Prophets and teachers were proclaimers of the Word of God. Now, most people, when you think of the word prophet, you think of someone who is foretelling the future. And right now, if you turn on TV, you will find shows about Nostradamus and other kinds of so-called prognosticators, prophets, who see into the future. Listen, I'm not talking about that. Although that is one aspect of the office of a prophet. The primary office of a prophet is a proclaimer of the revealed Word of God. So let me share with you, as I stand up here today and I proclaim to you the revealed Word of God, in a sense, I'm fulfilling the office of a prophet. Now, don't call me that, please. I'm just saying that was the primary purpose of a prophet. It was one who proclaimed the revealed Word of God. My primary office title is pastor. But I do proclaim the revealed Word of God. And teachers, who were teachers? Teachers were the ones who could break down the revealed Word of God into understandable portions. And as a result, people learned and grew. The problem we see in a lot of our mega churches today is there is no place for people to learn. They are not being taught. And we have to understand that a lot of what we're getting today is not a breakdown of the Word of God. It is mainly a dissemination of a lot of maybe feel goods and I think we ought to feel good I think we ought to give words of encouragement please but I think we need to know the Word of God and so <clears throat> we see here that this is what is going on in the church and he lists five names here that were leaders of the early church in Antioch let's look at them first there was Barnabas we all know who Barnabas is the son of consolation encouragement there was Simeon, who was called Niger. The word Niger means black. He was probably from North Africa. There's Lucius of Cyrene. Cyrene was also on the African continent. There was Menaean, who was a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch. Now think about this. Herod the Tetrarch grew up with a bunch of guys. Now in some historical writings, they make... Manan, a stepbrother to Herod the Tetrarch. But here it says he was a lifelong friend. But the original language allows for there to be a closer, almost familiar relationship. And so he grows up with the rich and powerful. But now notice what happens. And then, of course, there's Saul. <clears throat> but what happens? Manaean <clears throat> and Herod, two men growing up, same environment, a lot of the same influences. But notice what happens. They make choices. They make choices. And Herod turns in to a despot, an egotistical, narcissistic, political despot. He has James beheaded. But then you have Manaean over here who becomes the leader of the church at Antioch. He becomes one of the leaders, one of the elders. Two guys, same environment, same people they associated with, but they made choices. This is why I tell young people all the time, 
be careful who you hang with and be careful of the choices you make. Because the choices you make will make you. How many people made a wrong choice and they paid for it for a lifetime? They did things that God did not want them to do. They made choices early in their life. And as a result of those choices, their life was never the same. It may have been the person they married. It may have been the school they went to or didn't go to. It may be another life choice that they made. It may be that they went to a church and there was a revival and the gospel was being preached. And they sat there and said, I don't want this. Maybe when I'm old, I'll think about church. I'll think about God. I'll think about giving my life to Christ. But not now. Not now. And so they made a choice. And that choice began to determine the direction of their life. Choices. And that's the thing that we constantly are trying to emphasize to our young people. Make the right choice because it will determine so much of your life. And so we find Manaean, a leader of the church. <clears throat> now notice in verse uh, 2, it says, And when they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul. Now you're going to notice at this stage, Barnabas' name is first, then Saul. By the time we get a little further in, you're going to see the order reversed. It's going to be not Saul, but Paul. His name is going to change. And it's going to be Paul and Barnabas, not Barnabas and Saul. You see, we need to be growing into our destiny. Paul is growing into his destiny. And until he is ready to step into the destiny that God has for him, he is still in that training phase. He is still in that growing phase. He is still in that learning phase, even though God is using him mightily. Each one of us has a destiny. Each one of us has a spiritual role to play. The question is, have we stepped into that destiny? You say, well, I'm discouraged. I haven't found it yet. Well, at this point in Saul's life, it's been 10 years at least. He has moved from being this rabid rabbi and now he's moved into being this child of God. And so we see him making the decision as he follows with Barnabas. Now, I just want to say this and we're going to pick up the story a little later on. But in this moment, as they are in worship, as they are in prayer, as they are in fasting. As a matter of fact, the word here in the Greek is the word we get our word liturgy from. Liturgy means ministering to the Lord. And as they are ministering to the Lord, the Holy Spirit speaks. They are ministering to the Lord, not ministering for the Lord. They are ministering to the Lord. This is an important thing to understand. Do you understand how that God is blessed? Has anybody ever said to you, your ministry blessed me today? Your song blessed me. You ministered to me today in song. You ministered to me today in the Word. Has anybody ever said that to you? Most of you probably have had that. You felt like that God used you. And as you ministered, they were blessed. Listen, reverse that. Did you know you can bless the heart of God as you minister to Him? Question, when was the last time you were conscious of ministering to the Lord? You were actually conscious of the fact that you were ministering to the Lord. When people say to you, I was blessed by your ministry this morning, 
Can you think of God saying to you, I was blessed by your ministry to me this morning? Blessing God. The Bible says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, what? Bless his holy name. Let me ask you, is God blessed by your ministry to him? Have you been conscious of the fact that you are to minister to the Lord? We pray to him a lot of times because we want from him. But ministry to the Lord is a focus on him, not us. People sometimes come to church and say, well, I didn't get anything out of that this morning. I'm not getting fed. Can I just remind all of us of something? That we came here this morning and it's not about us. Should you be fed? Yes. Should you be encouraged? Yes. Should you be helped? Absolutely. But the focus is not coming to church to focus on me. The focus is that we come together and we focus on ministering to the Lord. As we minister to the Lord, guess what? Our praise goes up and His presence comes down. Did you feel the presence of God in ministry this morning? You see, when we come, we are to bring, bring our worship. Bring our worship. We are to bring our worship with us when we come through the doors. Worship doesn't start when Glenn or Gary or somebody starts to play. Worship is a gift we bring. The Bible talks about bringing the sacrifices of praise. Hmm. Did you ever think that your praise that you're bringing to him as you come through the door, you're praising him, you're bringing a sacrifice? And the Bible says as they were ministering to the Lord, not for the Lord, to the Lord, it was then they heard the Holy Spirit say, here's the next step. I believe if you need direction in your life, I believe that if you'll stop long enough and just get into the presence of God, exalt Him, worship Him, lift Him up, praise His name, as you are doing that, you know what's going to happen? God's going to come down because He inhabits the praise of His people and He will speak into your heart the next step. It is as you lift up and minister to that the blessing of God's direction comes down. Too much of the time we make it all about me and what I want and what I can get. And I come and I sit and then I just say, entertain me, feed me. <clears throat> what did you bring this morning? If you brought praise, if you brought worship, if you brought a heart of expectation. I guarantee you, if you came like that, God met you. God met you. And so, <clears throat> it says that after this, as they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul, for the work I have called them. Did you know you have a work that God has called you to? That work, you know, we want to separate sacred from secular. Did you know for the child of God, God never breaks our lives down into those two compartments? He never says, this is secular and this is sacred. Everything you do, do for what? The glory of God. If you're selling insurance, run your business for the glory of God. If you're farming, farm for the glory of God. If you're teaching, teach for the glory of God. Whatever God may have called you to do, do it for his glory. There is no separation between secular and sacred, not in the plan of God. 
He said, I have called them. God has called every one of you. What has he called you to do? Do it for his glory. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. This was an ordination. They laid their hands on Barnabas and Saul, and then they sent them. There is a divine cooperation between the Holy Spirit and the church of Jesus Christ. I think everybody knows, <clears throat> but I just want to remind you that the church is not this building. The church is this people. This building is just a place where we meet. People say, I'm going to church. I know what they mean, but technically we're going to the place where the church meets. The church is the called out assembly of believers that come together and meet. And when we come with expectation, and when we come believing, and we come looking for God and offering him our worship and praise, I guarantee you, God will show up. God will show up. <clears throat> and so I just want to close this morning with these thoughts. Number one, the king stole from God. If you're going to steal, don't steal from God. And what did he steal? He stole glory. He said, people said, you're a God, and he said, thank you. I, I received that. God says, no, you're not a God. Let me just show you what you are. God sent an angel, and the angel called forth from the inside of his body worms. You see, on the outside, he was glittering silver. But on the inside, he was being eaten by worms. God sees the inside. We look at the outside. And God said, I'll give my glory, nor will I share my glory with anyone. That belongs to him. That's his domain. <clears throat> and so God was teaching that he's not to be trifled with. And I want you to know, God, once again, on planet Earth, there's a day coming, very soon, when God himself will say, enough, enough. I've heard too much. I've seen too much. I have watched my creation, and I have seen it go through unnecessary pain because people have turned their back on righteousness. People are saying God does not exist. People are saying God is dead. People are saying that religion as we know it, Christianity, is not necessary. We are seeing today, I was reading a book this week, and it talked about how, the, how Christianity is being de-churched where people are not going to church anymore, and they listed reasons why. One of the biggest reasons why is because they are too busy. Too busy. It's not important enough. Another thing they said was that the church was not asking enough of their people to be more of a community, to be more of a body that really provides for its family. Well, there's a lot of reasons, but I think we all know that the Bible says in the last days there would be a great apostasy. We're seeing it. So, lesson one, the king stole what was not his. <clears throat> lesson two, and I think this is really an important thing that we need to remember, is that when the church is in unity, and ministering to God and lifting up praise and worship and they are in the presence of God I guarantee you God is going to show up and you're going to know it you will see it you will be able to experience it folks when you come to church are you looking to experience the presence of God sometimes we just 
come with the expectation of business as usual. But I believe God wants to surprise us. So come expecting. Come bringing the sacrifice of praise. Come bringing your worship with you. Giving it to God. And watch what he does with it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. Thank you, Father, that you are in charge. Thank you that even though Herod thought that he was somebody, the moment he reached out and touched your glory, he found out really fast just who he was. And so, Father, kings and kingdoms come and go. But you and your name and the promises of your word will last forever and ever. Father, this morning there may be folks here who don't know that, who don't understand how they can have a loving, accepting relationship with you that will bring them into your family, that will literally wipe away all the guilt of sin and all the stain and bring about an immediate, wonderful forgiveness. Father, there may be some here this morning that would like to unite with this church, some that need to be baptized, some, dear Father, who would like to come by transfer. I pray that they will come. Father, there may be others today that just have great burdens and needs. They just need prayer. May they understand that there will be folks who will be happy, willing, desiring to come alongside and pray with them. Meet their needs today, Father. Have your way with this time. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Let's all stand, if we would, please. Everybody's standing, and as the praise team sings, God is speaking to your heart. Please obey him.